Hi, Andre. Hi, Patrick. Hey, how are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Well, you managed to get up? Yeah, I did. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually great to be in California anyway. Yeah. Uh -huh. You you're in Santa Barbara? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Very nice. KTP has small number of people allowed for in-person activities. Really? Okay. Yeah, which was supposed to be real in-person activities, but then most of people who sign up for this couldn't cross the border. And so they are just right now, there's, I guess, one, two, three, probably four of us only. I see. You can actually gather indoors? No, we cannot. This is interesting. I reached okay. it was so that we will form a small group who will uh, collaborate within KTP. Now KTP is closed, so <laughs> we cannot go there. Uh, so we are bound to residents, but you know, this wonderful residents, they have blackboard in every corner, so. Okay, it's... okay. Well, I guess you can work outside too. It's yes, too ab now. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. No complaints. <laughs> Very good. Hello, Hi, Andre. How long Hello. is the program? Hello. How long is the program? Sorry? How long is the program? How long would you be there? Ah, uh, it runs till uh, mid-December. So mm -hmm. we are leaving back on December 18th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now, the program shifted to Twisted by Layer, which is now Twisted Tree Layer also. Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, but... Yeah, that was a remarkable talk by uh, Pablo yesterday. Yeah, yum, yum. So the story keeps developing and quickly. Yeah. Okay. I will leave you now so you can get started. Uh huh. Uh, hi, Julie. Shall we start? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Julie, can you yes. start a recording? So I can oh, yes. Start. Okay, well, Julie, start. Andre. I, uh, Hello everyone, so let's start now. Uh, today it's our great honor to have Professor Andrei Trubikov as our speaker for the seminar series on HTC Superconductor. Uh, Professor Andrei Trubikov is now in University of Minnesota. Uh, he has made great contributions to strongly correlated systems such as uh, quantum criticality, non-fermi liquid, and uh, ion superconductor. Uh, today he will talk about his recent work or uh, interplay between superconductor and uh, non fermi liquid. Uh, let's welcome Professor Andrew Trubico. Andrew, please. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. And thanks again for allowing me to move the time to a later one. I'm in California. So starting at 7.30 is uh, really almost a crime for a series. Would be a crime for a series. So anyway. Um, this work was done, uh, this is a series of work, which we are now publishing in series of papers in PRB. Uh, and it was done with several collaborators, uh, Artyom Abanov from Texas, Yushan Wang from Florida, and then two people from Minnesota, Yuming Wu, my student, and my postdoc, uh, Shang Shun Chang. Uh, and uh, the calculations were done by all of us, but some uh, conclusions are, or some interpretation is mine, and I'm only guilty for this one. So there are several motivations. I try to formulate this problem from several, pers several perspectives. First, this is a series about high TC, mostly cuprates. And so obvious, one of the obvious motivations is the physics of cuprates, the pseudo gap, which is um, subject of most discussions nowadays in the uh, cuprate community. And I guess the prevailing point of view on the pseudo gap, which I actually share, is that it's either a state with some long range order, uh, being a pair density wave, charge density wave, maybe anti-ferromagnetic loop current, topological order, 
or a precursor either to one of the states or uh, just to mode phase. But going back in time, uh, there were some ideas that not necessarily the whole pseudo gap, but at least some range above superconducting PC can be viewed as a failed superconductor in a sense that it's a story about superconductor order destroyed by fluctuations, but such that phase is uh, phase of order parameters destroyed by magnitude remains. And the key argument for this point of view, again, this is not a story about full pseudo gap, it's a story about some range above PC. Uh, so experimental evidence mostly came from uh, photo emission, and this is cartoon of the actual data, which shows that yes, in the superconducting state, you have a sharp quasi-particle peak. Uh, and if you go away from superconducting space, the peak um, goes down and eventually disappears. But if you look at the, what's called leading edge gap, uh, the, it remains pretty much the same, uh, both above and below TC, which means that the scales associated with pseudo gap and the scales associated with superconductivity are very similar scales. And this, of course, you know, uh, interpretations or field interpretations based on fluctuating superconductor. There were a number of papers about this, but they were mostly phenomenological. Uh, you introduce a finite dumping of fermions, assume that <clears throat> above PC dumping rapidly grows, and that's how you explain the, try to explain the data. What we are trying to do is to understand whether this can be obtained microscopically within a well-defined model using a controlled approximation. So this is one of the motivation of this work. And another one actually come from totally different perspective. Let's consider a standard textbook problem for superconductivity, probably the simplest one one can imagine, pairing by Einstein boson. Uh, but I will take a particular limit when uh, the by frequency or basically frequency of this uh, Einstein bosons uh, gradually goes to zero. And then you take a simplest possible interaction. It's basically a standard interaction mediated by uh, Einstein boson. And then I would use the word we were taught in school that this interaction is attractive at frequencies below the by frequency and repulsive and frequencies actually this missed in is uh, repulsive and frequencies above the by frequency. The problem has dimensionless coupling, which is the ratio of what I put G as the overall factor and the by frequency. And therefore, uh, you can look at weak coupling, which is again, textbook BCS story. And then you know the formula, the by frequency times exponent. Uh, important here is that this temperature is much smaller than the by frequency. And therefore, everything comes entirely from uh, attraction. By the way, here and below everywhere uh, in all formulas today, Positive sign of interaction would mean, I define the interaction such that the positive sign means uh, attraction, negative sign means attraction. So um, this temperature or this superconductivity come entirely from attraction. But there was part of the story that started, I guess in 1975 with work by Alan Dines about what happens when you go to stronger coupling. And the stronger coupling, the statement, the original statement was that TC uh, keeps growing. I label this as TP rather than TC to separate onset of pairing from superconductivity. Although at this stage, I have absolutely no right to do this. I would just use notation uh, for pairing instability temperature rather than superconductivity by the reasons that would be clear later. Anyway, message here is that uh, calculations, which was originally done semi terminologically and then later done by quite a number of people, who, uh, some of them shown here, the actual number is larger, um, doing more sophisticated Elias-Berg calculations for, uh, pairing, for the same type of pairing interaction. They all show that um, instability temperature becomes substantially larger than the by frequency at strong coupling and original formula, it scales as omega d square root of lambda. But if you take what lambda is and put it back, you find that this temperature is nothing but g times some universal number. And the fact that this transition temperature is g means that even if you take a formal limit when the by frequency goes to zero, this temperature still remains fine. Which is kind of strange because uh, it's the limit when the by frequency goes to zero, you get entirely repulsive interaction. Moreover, you can solve nonlinear gap equation and find that, yes, there is a standard 
gap of order. It has some frequency dependence, but nothing particularly uh, interesting. And most important that if you look at the scale for this gap, it's the same scale as G, the same scale of uh, TP. And as a remark, it was uh, somehow thought that this is a um, completely unphysical case of extremely, extremely strong coupling. This is recent quantum Monte Carlo analysis by Ilya Esteris and Steve Kivelson, um, which shows that this kind of behavior with saturation of uh, instability temperature as effective coupling, not the bare one, but effective coupling uh, goes to infinity and effective Debye frequency goes to zero, it does saturate at the scale, which is quite comparable to um, what pure calculations in the formal limit when coupling goes to infinity are. And of course, in reality, the system never reaches infinite coupling. It becomes unstable about against something else before you reach it. So what I want to understand here is, in some sense, how it's possible. Um, calculations, actual calculations that led to all these wonderful formulas were done on Matsubara axis. The Matsubara axis, you effectively change the sign of omega square and interaction looks like attractive. But in reality, if you look at a uh, real case, uh, and if you calculate observable such as density of states, et cetera, you do it on real axis. So the question is how a paired state with the absolutely conventional S-wave sign preserving gap develops out of supposedly pure repulsive interaction. And the third motivation, which in some sense links the first and the second, is this one. Uh, I started by saying that um, at least looking at photo emission experiments, attempting to suggest that in some range above PC, uh, the system can be viewed as phase disordered supercapacity. But, uh, and there is a well-defined uh, series about how to obtain um, pairing without phase coherence. But this series are mostly related to um, effect from mod physics. What I want to understand is whether the same is possible for itinerant formulas without involving mod physics, which in reality means that I will always keep interaction uh, smaller than the bandwidth, even if we get non-fermi liquid physics, and we, of course, will get non-fermi liquid physics in this story. So the make long story short is this. Uh, practically all calculations of itinerant, of pairing uh, of itinerant fermions use one of another form of extended Eliasberg theory of superconductors. And Eliasberg theory as a theory, not as a computational procedure, of course, requires small parameters. You need small parameter to neglect vertex corrections in particular. And we know what happens in strong coupling electron phonon problems. Since I already talked about this, let me use it as an example. We have strong coupling in the sense that coupling is much larger than the bi-frequency, but nevertheless, we'll still need to invoke a small parameter, which basically tells you that your boson is slow compared to electrons. And in vertex corrections, fermions are forced to vibrate on boson frequencies, and they must be far away from their own resonance for vertex correction to be small. And if you look at parameters, basically you multiply coupling by the ratio of the by frequency and fermion, your bandwidth, whatever you prefer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you then find out, going back and put what lambda is, you find that this is parameter which does contain the by frequency denominator, but it also contains fermion. And so in theory, if you want to keep theory under control, then if you want to take really limit when the by frequency goes to zero, you have to do it accurately by taking double limit. When the by frequency goes to zero, simultaneously Fermi energy goes to infinity, such that you keep this parameter small, otherwise theory will be <clears throat> without any control. And um, there is one immediate consequence of this. If you calculate by standard means phase stiffness within the same model, you find that this phase stiffness turns out to be parametrically larger than uh, onset temperature for the pairing. And the ratio is exactly the same small parameter that makes theory workable or makes theory uh, justifiable. Which means that if you take this literally, uh, Eliasberg theory is always incompatible with strong phase fluctuations. There may be some precursors to superconductivity, but they only exist in a narrow range 
below a pairing and stability temperature, and then pair state immediately becomes um, phase, phase coherent. So last thing that uh, last motivation is uh, to check whether what I just said is ultimate truth or there are some conditions when the situation is more complex and you still have itinerant fermions, you still have um, put a generalized Elias-Berg theory, but this formula doesn't work. And so rho s can be uh, substantially smaller than this number, again, without invoking localization of fermions, which is a mod physics. And with all this, the goal of the study uh, is to address all this issue by analyzing pairing in a clean metal, there will be no uh, impurities, uh, near the onset of one or another way of spinner charge order. And before I start, uh, let me say one phrase. You will see a number of results, you will see a number of interpretations, but uh, I encourage people who listen uh, to jump into this problem and do something, find out that we made a mistake, something like this. Because I think it's a fascinating problem, and the more people will look into this, the better. So here is the set. Sorry, Andrei, um, before yeah. you continue, may I ask a very quick question? Go ahead, Andrei go ahead. Andrei Navidomsky. Sure, I, I know. The question is to your, um, to your motivation. I guess if you could go to just two slides back. This one, yeah, the previous this, one. This would do. This would do. Um, the question I have, in, and I forgive me if this is naive. Um, so usually in a conventional BCS theory, the way the lambda is introduced is more along the lines of what you call lambda e. It's roughly like g divided by ef, or, or some or some strength electron phonon coupling times density of states. Um, but the way your lambda is defined in this box on the left hand side, that that has that doesn't seem to know about where the formula level is, what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just g squared divided by omega. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to clarify. Absolutely. Yep. Is the consistency? No, 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 no. Um, lambda is defined here just simply one plus lambda is master normalization. So in this respect, it's the same. What you are saying is correct, but uh, there is one thing under the rug here. What is under the letter G? I put effective pairing, inter dimensionless pairing interaction, dimensionless, it's important, as mm -hmm. G squared divided by, if you like, omega D squared. So density of states is, in some sense, part of this G. So, um, but again, uh, whatever you, you can define G in any way you want, and I define it as such that to make presentation easiest. But uh, in any case, there are two independent parameters. You can have strong coupling, which means mass renormalization is much larger than one. And you will see that this means that over wide range of frequencies, self energy has non fermi liquid form. But at the same time, when you calculate vertex corrections, it's a different parameter. It's some call it migdal parameter anyway. I see. But it's so it's, it's all within this letter G, uh, and it all depends how you define this letter G. I define it as in the simplest possible way. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, good. Okay, so here is the set. Uh, let's suppose in general that we have some system of itinerant fermions, which under some external parameter being doping, doping pressure, magnetic field, moves towards instability, uh, towards some sort of ordered state. This ordered state, as I said, can be charge density wave, spin density wave, most likely pair density wave, uh, I would say loop currents, although I didn't do any calculations. So in this regard, pneumatic, definitely. Um, and there are three basic facts about system behavior in the vicinity of a quantum critical point, which is basically point of departure of uh, our analysis. One is that if you're in dimensions three or smaller, uh, the system develops non fermi liquid as a quantum critical point, which means that uh, if you calculate self energy right at this point, you find that both real and imaginary part of omega scale as some fractional power of frequency and exponent is smaller than one means that you never had a condition uh, that at smallest frequencies, omega is larger than self energy, which means that fermions live uh, infinitely long time, uh, infinitely close to Fermi surface, which is a cornerstone of Fermi liquid. You have Fermi liquid on both sides of the transition, but there is a, um, a or a triangle of uh, or slice of non-Fermi liquid in between the two Fermi liquid phases. 
And the second is um, strong attraction, which by itself is not that trivial problem because interaction is generally repulsive on a surface. But as we learned very well for the cuprates and then later for iron-based and then for uh, other systems, the system always find a way to get attraction in some non-ordinary S-wave channel. For anti-ferromagnetic case, it's D-wave. For ferromagnetic case, it would be P-wave. And then for Ising pneumatic cases, there are a number of um, channels in which the system is interaction is attractive. And um, it's not a theorem. So it's entirely possible. And there are exact examples when the system at the critical point has no attraction in any channel. But for most cases, what happens is that if you neglect non fermi liquid self-energy and just consider pairing interaction, you find the channels with particular spatial symmetry where the system is attractive. And therefore, there will be a dome of pairing instability, under pairing instability. And because there is no self-energy, no, no, no incoherence, then obviously you expect that this will be a true superconductivity in this range. So on one hand, non fermi liquid, if left, without pairing. On the other hand, superconductivity, if I forget about non fermi liquid. And basic fact number three is a very simple one. There is a competition between these two phenomena. They compete, if you like, for the Fermi surface. <clears throat> but even in the more simple words is this, that if you consider, if you start with incoherent fermions and consider pairing of in, incoherent fermions, there will be no ordinary Cooper logarithm. And I will show this explicitly a few slides below. On the other hand, if you assume that the pairing is there, then obviously pairing produces a gap. And even if the gap has no, it's still uh, it predominantly gaps out low energy states. And if you recalculate self-energy, you find pretty much formal liquid behavior with some non-trivial powers, but still conditions that sigma double prime much smaller than omega is satisfied. Uh, just one last slide before I start showing the result. Uh, I already mentioned small parameter in particular case of electron phonon coupling. I will consider itinerant forming systems for which this uh, approximation is uh, justified. Namely, that there is small parameter which rigorously allows one to neglect vertex corrections. And this parameter is different from different theories. Uh, but uh, I always assume that um, there is smallness in the theory that um, allows one to neglect vertex corrections. Normally, this uh, requires that uh, velocity of fermions is larger than velocity of a pairing boson, whatever pairing boson is. It can be external one like phonon, but for most cases I will study is just pairing by collective bosonic excitations of fermions. So bosons need to be slow compared to fermions, which works mostly well when bosons are Landau over them. And uh, on one hand, this restricts uh, applicability. On the other hand, this sets a very strict set of rules how to analyze both non Fermi liquid and pairing, which sometimes called generalized Eliasberg theory uh, by named by a person whose photograph I could hardly find, in fact, but I did. Um, and um, in a simple words, it means this. In order to analyze self-energy and pairing, you need to calculate two quantities. You need to calculate fermionic self-energy that will be responsible for the destruction of coherence in the normal state. And you need to calculate pairing vertex, which is responsible for the pairing. And when you calculate both of them, you need to write down diagrammatics. And this diagrammatics will include interaction over intermediate momenta and frequencies. And this set of rules basically tells you that you know how to do integration of for momenta, which again is problem sensitive and it needs, one has to be careful. And I guess Max Mitlitsky and Subir Sajiv shows this as the most known example of anti ferromagnetic case that you really need to be careful with integration over momentum. But long story short, it turns out that you can integrate over momentum and then reduce the pairing problem to competition between two time dependent or frequency dependent variables. One will be frequency dependent self energy, another will be frequency dependent pairing vertex. And information about spatial symmetry of the superconducting state is already incorporated when you integrate over momentum. 
So I will consider systems with different spatial symmetry of the superconducting state, but this will be hidden in the form of uh, phi of omega, which is already after momentum integration. So if you like, this is local momentum integrated quantities. And for spin singlet superconductivity, this gives two supposedly simple formulas. One for the pairing vertex, one for the self-energy. They are coupled, definitely. One knows about the other. In competition, I uh, discussed before, I was named before. It's all inside these formulas. Uh, the quantity that most people are more familiar with, which is called superconducting gap, that you put in BCS-like formula, omega square minus delta square, is just the ratio of pairing vertex and one plus sigma over omega. So when sigma is out, then superconducting gap and the pairing vertex are the same. What is different from conventional problem here is the form of effective pairing interaction. I said effective because this is pairing interaction integrated along the Fermi surface. Some weak sense it's uh, analog of what's called alpha square f for electron phonon interaction. But um, here's a story that you can do all this in a Fermi liquid. And of course, it was done by a number of people. And there is a whole Eliasberg machinery of calculating uh, instability temperature and then uh, gap function in a superconducting state by putting in different forms of interaction and then solving this set of equations. Numerically, it's quite doable. But for all cases uh, of conventional, I would say, Eliasberg theory, uh, the story was that you always have a pairing interaction, uh, which is massive, which means that in the limit of zero frequency, it uh, reduces to some constant. In this sense, the problem is not qualitatively different from BCS. Uh, details, of mm -hmm. course, matter, but there is no qualitative distinction. Any problems of that kind can be adiabatically transformed into weak coupling BCS limit. Uh, I will consider a different situation when we are at the critical point, uh, bosons are massless, and as a result, effective pairing interactions that you put, or effective interactions that you put both in a particle hole channel, and this would give you non-Fermi liquid. And you put the same interaction in the particle-particle channel, and this would give you pairing. Uh, so this interaction diverges at zero frequency because bosons are massless, and diverges with some exponent gamma. Which brings me to what was nicknamed as gamma model, a set of models for different types of quantum critical phenomena, which at the end all described by the same equations, but with different values of the exponent gamma. And there is a long list of models and a long list of people with immediate apologies if somebody is not mentioned. The number of people is definitely larger than the one that I mentioned here. The most uh, popular cases are uh, situation near a pneumatic or Ising pneumatic transition in two dimensions when full interaction is, um, you can put mass here, is at small momentum transfer plus Landau damping when you integrate this interaction over um, along the Fermi surface, you basically do one dimensional integration over momentum, you put mass to zero, you get uh, divergence with exponent one third. You can do the same for what's called hot spot model for anti-ferromagnetism. You get exponent one half. And uh, as I said, quite a number of people, uh, including Max Mitlitsky, Subir, who did something that people before them didn't do for these models, studied this problem. There was a number of studies coming from both condensed matter community and high energy community to analyze what happens near, if you like, near three dimensions when exponent is small and you can expand around the Fermi liquid and then see uh, in expansion in gamma how Fermi liquid get destroyed. This all started with um, Son's work of marginal interaction when chi is just logarithmical and then extended to the cases when the exponent gamma is uh, not zero but small. There are cases for gamma 1.2 was suggested for iron-based systems. 
The case that I discussed before, uh, electron-phon interaction at vanishing Debye frequency in this notation corresponds to gamma equal to two. You just have one over omega squared behavior at um, uh, vanishing frequency. And notice that everywhere here I put Matsubara frequency. So here, so far the story is formulated in terms of in Matsubara space. Uh, there has been recent interest uh, on pairing in Sibir's SYK model. And it can be done in various ways, but in the way how it was done by Ilya Esteres and Jörg Schmalen on one hand, Jörg Schmalen on the other hand, and Laura Klassen uh, is doing something uh, along this line, uh, you get essentially dispersionless fermions randomly interacting with bosons. And interestingly enough, that pairing problem also reduces to the same pairing equation as in the gamma model with some particular exponent, which is either 0.6 or in one particular limit, it's equivalent to exponent equal to two. So number of different models, but they all describe by the same set of equations. And let me start by looking at this model and trying to understand interplay between two competing phenomena. One is pairing, another is non fermi and uh, as I said, these two phenomena compete with each other, but moreover, they are uh, what's now, I guess, modern called intertwined. In a sense, they come from the same sort and relevant energies are the same for both phenomena. What I mean is that if you look at the pairing interaction, because pairing interaction decreases at high frequencies as one over omega to power of gamma, the pairing problem is completely ultraviolet convergent. Uh, which leaves the only scale in the problem this uh, effective coupling. So if, if the system develops pairing, which is not guaranteed, but if it's developed, then there is no other option but that pairing, pairing and stability temperature is coupling times some function of gamma. On the other hand, if you look at non-fermi liquid, assuming that the system remains non-fermi liquid down to zero temperature, you calculate self-energy, it has non-fermi liquid form with exponent one minus gamma for this particular case. And again, we need normalization with the scale of gamma and normalization is provided G and again, some function of exponent gamma is uh, as the overall factor. So when you look at this formula, you ask what it tells you. It tells you that the system splits into low frequency quantum critical non-fermi liquid regime, if you like, uh, where self energy is larger than frequency because power is smaller than one. And of course, at high frequencies, self energy is smaller than frequency. And despite that, self energy still has a non Fermi liquid form, you essentially have Fermi gas when um, interactions are much smaller. Interaction effects are perturbatively small. And the scale which separates the two is the same scale of G. So the same scale, which is supposed to be scale for pairing instability is the scale is also the upper edge for the Fermi liquid. And which means that typical scales are the same, which really means that there is a competition between two phenomena. One phenomena wants to make the system non Fermi liquid down to zero temperature. Another wants it to make it super pairing state. Let me start with something very simple. Put everything on a computer and check whether so non fermi liquid wins or loses in the sense that simple answer whether or not there is a finite pairing instability temperature in this problem. This can be done numerically. And when you do this, you find out that pairing wins, namely for any value of gamma, no matter what, you still, you always have a pairing instability temperature which generally scales as G, as I said, uh, and uh, the fact that it's always non-zero means that the system wants to develop at low temperature pair state instead of remaining um, non-fermi liquid down to zero temperature. Moreover, as was emphasized by a number of people who studied small gamma limit, if you look formally in the limit of small gamma, then this temperature goes up simply by construction of the model. It essentially becomes unconstrained BCS and this limit interaction is almost constant, but still decays very slowly at large frequencies. So pairing problem is still formally ultraviolet convergent, but of course the scale becomes very large. And so pairing instability becomes quite large. It's actually exponentially large in this limit. Uh, 
But the story here is that uh, in this particular limit, of course, Peric entirely eliminates non Fermi liquid region. So by continuity, you may also assume that even if uh, gamma is of order of one, which is most of the cases for interesting, which is the case for most interesting models, you still have qualitatively the same behavior. Namely that uh, essentially non Fermi liquid doesn't play much role and you go back to almost BCS-like behavior when uh, pairing developed before the system start developing any non fermi liquid phenomena. But it's not the case, in fact, by several reasons. And one is supposedly uh, straightforward, which is, I would call it, conceptual difference with BCS. And conceptual difference goes this way. Uh, if you look more carefully at what we just solved numerically, namely linearized gap equations that give us information about pairing instability temperature, you may look at the kernel of this equation and see what's going on. And there are three terms in the kernel. I will try to go through this rather quickly. Uh, one come from self-energy, another come from the interaction, and the third term just knows about bare frequency uh, in the problem. In fact, this term times this one is omega plus sigma. And interesting observation here is that this is really a problem with effective coupling of order of one. Because as I said, non-Fermi liquid and um, pairing are of the same scale. You don't have anything besides number as the overall factor. And the only information about the scale is here and uh, this factor which normalizes omega. So if you renormalize omega by G, according to normalized temperature by G, you get completely universal pairing problem. But what I want to emphasize here is a combination of these two terms. If you do a simple power law counting, you find that there is a power one minus gamma here, the power of gamma here. So by power counting, it gives you power of one, which means the problem is marginal, which means that in perturbation theory, there are logarithms. And you may say that this is very similar to BCS, where this power in BCS would be one, this power would be zero, but still you will get total power of one, and you again will have logarithms in perturbation theory. So from this perspective, it looks supposedly similar to BCS. However, as I said, there is one conceptual difference. If you start really doing this, put some bare pairing vertex, impose some pairing vertex, and then essentially calculate pairing susceptibility by summing up logarithms, you find out that in distinction to BCS, when you sum up logarithms and only logarithms, you don't get any indication of a pairing. The idea here is, of course, that what you want to do is to get the scale like in BCS, where solution becomes unstable, and this will give you the scale of TC. Uh, you don't get anything like this. It's basically different RG equations. In BCS, it would be dg over dl or df over dl is equal to f square. Here it's linear. So, uh, but not going into RG, this is what you just simply get. You sum up these logarithms, you get power low divergence, but you don't have any special scale when uh, pairing vertex would blow up. And of course, in distinct qualitative distinction BCS, where you do the same calculations, and of course, you immediately get a scale, which we all know is BCS instability temperature. One question, Andre. Yes, sure. Um, supposing you have uh, gamma going to zero, mm -hmm. but gamma going to zero in the sense that uh, the fluctuation spectrum is flat as a function of frequency. Mm -hmm then you only get a log square, the leading singularity is log square. Absolutely, if, if interaction is logarithmical. Which I'm not seeing from here. Ah, good question. Chandra, it is there, and of course we uh, found it. What happens is that uh, this scale, I put this formula for arbitrary gamma. What happens if gamma goes to zero, there is a factor here under the logarithm, which blows up. And as a result, when you look at carefully, you eventually get log square behavior. So log square is there, but in fact, to be completely honest, uh, not honest, but it's, it's uh, really the case. Might uh, be, situation it when, might uh, be good not to hide it because that may be the only interesting experimental case. Uh, maybe, but um, I would say that, well, I would say Son did it first. 
not this way. Uh, York and I did it this way. And uh, in fact, let me tell you something, since Chandra asked, let me tell you something important here. So I phrase it, uh, and I think it's completely true, that if you take finite gamma and try to sum up logarithms, you get this power law behavior. You don't get any indication of the scale. If you take the case, of course, gamma strictly equal to zero is BCS, and you just get this. But if you take the case that Chandra was talking about, this is a limit when gamma goes to zero, when interaction is just log omega or log frequency difference. Then you will get log squared terms instead of logs. And this is a case where summing up these log squared terms, you will see instability. But you will see instability in a very strange way. You will get some crazy prefactors in front of log, log square, log cube, etc. And it requires either sharp eye or knowing what son obtained before to realize that under the um, when you sum this up, you get cosine of log square in denominator. And therefore, the, when cos argument of cosine is equal to pi half, you get divergence, you get instability. So we obtain this, and yes, the series do reproduce one over cosine of log square. But again, without knowing what Son did before, we probably will not be able to do it. So if you don't mind, I will just continue with uh, this part, this, uh, the cases gamma not equal to zero, but finite. Uh, if gamma is finite, and uh, as I said, you sum up logs, and you don't get anything. But then you look more carefully into low frequency regime when you combine these two powers, and you find out that, yeah, the problem is marginal, but uh, because external frequency is inside the interaction, you are not in the just limit. You expect that the solution will be power law. And when you, you just substitute power law form here, you get back the same foul form, and then you find out what the exponent is. And if the exponent is real, if the exponent was real, you basically go back to here. You don't get any instability. However, if you do these calculations, you find out that exponents are complex. There are two complex conjugated exponents, which means that the solution is oscillating. And oscillating means that definitely it's not perturbative, because in the perturbation theory, if you start with a constant and then sum up corrections, you cannot get any point where uh, your solution changes sign because you know all coefficients here is positive so we cannot have this equal to zero at one point and positive in all others and uh, this story with complex exponent uh, is in my opinion quite fascinating it attracted quite a number of people from condensed matter community but also it attracted quite a number of people from high energy community and adding to this very quickly um, in uh, it was uh, sort of uh, art to extend the model to finite n to see more clearly competition between non-fermi liquid and superconductivity. And if you just put a factor n here, which would mean that you change pairing interaction, you reduce pairing interaction by n without reducing interaction in the particle hole channel, you find that there is a critical n when solution goes from real exponent to complex exponent. And this will be really end point of superconductivity at zero temperature, pairing at zero temperature. So, and you can expand around this critical point, find uh, big AT physics and a lot of nice stuff can be done there. But I will continue with the original model. And so there are two complex exponent. Complex exponent means solution is oscillating. And this means that there is a scale when oscillation ends. And this obviously scale when perturbation theory breaks down. So uh, very naive and the logical thing would be to associate the scale with panic instability temperature. As we do in BCS when we say we find um, at zero temperature the scale when this is below which system becomes unstable and then we associate the scale with the pairing transition, with pairing temperature. And it actually works. Okay. Uh, Andre, can I interrupt with a few questions? Yes, please. Here, uh, so, sorry. Um, 
but I don't want to get lost. So just to be sure, so this is for the case gamma less than one. Is that what you're looking at here? No, no, no. Right now I'm talking about arbitrary gamma, actually smaller than two to be completely exact here. No, it does, okay. gamma doesn't have to be smaller than one in this situation. So, so the logic is that you, you look at the linearized equation and in the linearized equation that takes a zero temperature, you find a complex solution. Yes. What that means is that there's this, you should really look at finite temperature where there will be a com some instability. Yes. And you, but you're, which would be a completely regular solution, which will not be isolating. I'm, um, I'm, I'm coming but, to this point. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're in the regime where your T less than TC, you're at zero temperature, where it really should be a superconductor and you're looking at uh, eigenmodes of this pairing vertex, uh, essentially. Right, 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 okay. right. This is what will come next. Yes. Absolutely. This is exactly what will come next. But at this moment, just uh, to be sure that I fully understand the question, let me repeat. At this moment, I'm doing the same type analysis as uh, if you like was done for BCS. I'm looking at zero temperature and I find that there is at low frequencies, there are some, there is oscillations. I know that I will not get this oscillation perturbatively if I start with a constant and then start putting in perturbation theory. I know that at high frequencies, perturbation theory works perfectly well. So I can identify the scale where perturbation theory breaks down. And just as we do for BCS, all I'm saying at this moment is this. Uh, I want to associate the scale with instability temperature, which would mean that all these oscillations that I found are actually completely unphysical in the sense that superconductivity or, or gap function will eliminate all of all these oscillations. It just give me a scale. Did I answer the question? I, I think so, maybe. So let me try to say it a different way. Let's say, so if I, suppose I really want to work in the physical regime mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, where, I, where, I, where T is bigger than your uh, TC. You found mm -hmm. some TC, and, but your T is bigger than TC. There, of course, this solution has no, this equation has no solutions. So what one should really do is take the two-point correlation function of two Cooper pairs and look at its correlation functions. Now that's much harder. So you're trying to get some information on that two-point correlation function by looking at these uh, in something uh, off of the complex plane at zero temperature. Is that a good way to say what you're doing? Yes, it is. It is correct. It is correct. Yes. Yes. And what? Uh, and you will hear continuation of the story in less than five minutes. But at this stage, what I'm saying is that it seems to work. And it actually works. I don't have to say it seems to work. Namely, you get a scale and you can do it at small gamma where the calculations requires more efforts because oscillation extends to larger frequencies. You can do it for arbitrary gamma when you get the scale. And if you associate the scale with instability temperature, you can plot the scale and then compare to what we get numerically by just solving linearized gap equation at finite temperature and find where eigenvalue crosses one. And you find the same behavior, namely that instability temperature saturates at large gamma and exponentially goes up at small gamma. And in fact, even power is exactly the same. So these features are completely caught. And moreover, referring to what I said a minute ago, if you solve, then you can say, okay, I solve the actual nonlinear gap equation at zero temperature. Now there is no oscillations, nothing. It's conventional sign preserving solution. So then all we get from oscillations, in fact, is this scale, this particular values of gamma, when a gap function actually starts saturating. So uh, going back, sorry, what I'm saying is that this gave us indication that normal state is not, form, not a conventional, not a non-fermi liquid. That if you start with non-fermi liquid and start basically looking at a um, small value of pairing vertex, you find that solutions that you get or form of the pairing vertex is definitely non-perturbative. Uh, but again, at this stage, there is a scale 
and scale is such that all this region of oscillations is completely eliminated by a finite superconducting by pairing gap. I keep using the word superconducting. Keep in mind that it's a pairing gap. And with this, I want to say that this is the tip of the iceberg. That in fact, what I said before uh, is correct, but there is more to this. That uh, this solution, this oscillating solution, is not simply a way to rationalize finite transition temperature. It actually is a solution at zero temperature. So what I'm trying to say is that the pairing problem at quantum critical point, and this, this is the real beginning of the stories that I want to convey, that uh, pairing at the quantum critical point is in many aspects qualitatively different from either BCS or Eliasberg generalized Eliasberg theory, in the sense that there is not one but infinite number of solutions for the gap at the critical point. And again, I shouldn't probably say this. Before we focused on we use t equal to zero, so not solution but rational to uh, justify that there is instability temperature. Now I want to focus at exactly zero temperature. And I will argue that there is infinite number of topologically different solutions for either pairing or equivalently the gap function with the same spatial symmetry. So we are talking not about D wave versus S wave versus F wave. We are talking about one same spatial symmetry. And how we know this? Well, after number of efforts, mostly by Artyom, um, we found exact solution of linearized gap equation. So then uh, it's really exact solution at zero temperature, which is sometimes very surprising result. This is onset of pairing instability. So you assume that linearized gap equation has a solution at this temperature. And if you go down, you start developing a gap and only nonlinear gap equation has a solution. Now I'm talking about zero temperature. I'm talking about solution of linearized gap equation and it exists. Uh, it has a crazy form, but um, the way, one easy way to check is to uh, plot the solution, put it back into original equation and see that the original equation is satisfied. Um, it can be written analytically, but then it contains infinite product of gamma functions. So I'm not sure that it's um, very much of use for uh, analytical theories. But nevertheless, this all the solutions, I put solutions for different values of gamma, uh, they look differently when you plot them, but in fact, it's very much the same solution. For small frequencies, it's matter only what you call small. Solution oscillates, as I said, it's this, uh, oscillation with the complex exponent, which I can always write down at cosine of uh, logarithm of frequency with some prefactor. At large frequencies, they all de decay as one over omega to power of gamma, which is just dictated by the interaction. And in between, oscillations increase in magnitude and then stop, etc. And again, this solution exists for any value of gamma at least smaller than two, and two included. This is number one. And as a, yeah, I will label this as delta infinity because there is infinite number of oscillations. Why I do this? Because uh, we also found different solutions and they have finite number of oscillations, finite number of sign changes. And the easiest way to show this is that we solve very accurately for the onset temperatures of pairing, so eigenvalues. The previous one that I showed you is the largest one. It's this one. Uh, it has it's correspond to sign preserving solution. So in this notation, this n equal to zero. But it turns out that there is another sign, another solution, another solution, another solution, another solution. And I guess with uh, this heroic effort with numerics. Uh, 16th or 17th solution has been found. Uh, you can look at eigenfunctions for these solutions. And then you see exactly what I said. Eigenfunction for this solution does not change sign. Eigenfunction for the next solution changes sign once, then the next one changes sign two times, the next one changes sign 16 times, etc. So, and all the solutions, of course, develop at different temperatures. And then they all range t equal to zero and form a discrete but infinite set of solutions at zero temperature. And in this respect, this problem is really qualitatively different from BCS, where we normally talk about just one solution. 
And uh, it's just a remark that uh, I already mentioned that um, when you look at this n equal to zero solution, you start with trial form, which has oscillating function, and then you use this highest temperature um, essentially to cut all oscillations by the gap. For the next one, you cut all by leave one oscillation. For the next one, you cut all but leave two oscillations, et cetera, et cetera. And this immediately tells you that this temperature should go exponentially with the number of oscillations. And of course, it does go exponentially, which you can see from this form. It was really nice to see a complete confirmation of analytics with numerical data. Uh, now, why I said that are topologically distinct? I'm saying this something by simple reason that if you have zero of the gap function of Matsubara frequency, this is the vortex in a complex frequency plane. If you just move slightly away from Matsubara frequency and introduce a complex gap, because gap is always complex function for complex frequency, um, it has a magnitude and it has a phase. And if I plot the phase for solutions with zero, one, two crossings, then immediately see that crossing point, if you make a circle around crossing point, phase winds up by two pi, and here it winds up two times by two pi at different crossing points. Uh, so each crossing point, each zero on Matsubara frequency is, is a vortex. And so in this respect, solutions are really topologically distinct. Uh, you cannot go from one solution to the other because then you have to bring vortex from infinity. Um, and this will cost you, in fact, infinite energy. Uh, right. And last point, I already mentioned this. This is really a property of quantum critical point. Uh, you can do calculations with putting finite mass of a boson, which means that interaction now goes back to conventional and tends to a finite value at zero frequency. And you immediately see how the solutions start disappearing. Solution is with eigenvalue crosses one, and you see this is original result. Then you take a very small mass and only, I guess, two solutions survive, make mass a little bit larger. Only one non-trivial survives. And then, uh, in fact, you go back to BCS, there is only one solution. But immediately when you put a mass, solution of linearized equation no longer exists. So you now go back to qualitative the same behavior as BCS, where at most you have a few solutions left. Again, at, at quantum critical point, you have an infinite set. Now, important part of the story. Uh, how this affects superfluid stiffness, if any? And you may say it does not, because remember, these are different solutions. Each has its own condensation energy. Condensation energy is proportional to the number of particles. And so even if you plot the set of condensation energy, as long as the set is discrete and you just have distant solu different solutions, you always focus on the one that has the largest condensation energy. And not surprisingly, this is a conventional solution. It develops at the largest temperature. It has the largest gap. And so in this respect, all other solutions, it's interesting to observe that they are, and they probably contribute to fluctuations at finite temperatures. But if you look at um, stiffness and the proper superconducting properties of their properties at low temperatures, you only focus on one solution. So in this respect, it's a peculiarity, but it does not give you anything fundamental. But it turns out that this set would exist for any value of gamma. It starts with almost the horizontal line, and then uh, only n equal to zero solution is really the one that uh, is relevant for small values of gamma. But as gamma increases, the, sense, the set becomes more and more dense. So uh, anyway, I had a question for I, you. Uh, sure, but I can hardly hear you. Sorry, I can hardly hear you. Can you do it again? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Uh, I lost the question. Can you hear me? Yes, Andre, we can hear you. Yeah, OK. Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question or I will continue at this point? Okay, I can hear a question, so let me continue and then uh, if possible, I will answer the question later. So um, what I'm trying to say is that as long as the set is discrete, 
it's interesting peculiarity to have an infinite set of solutions, but in reality, only the ones that with the lowest condensation energy actually matters at low temperatures. But it turns out that there is a interesting behavior as gamma increases and critical value here is gamma equal to two. And in five minutes, we'll see why gamma is to two is critical. To make long story short, what happens is that in this particular case, which in fact is the case of electron phonon interaction at vanishing Debye frequency, the set becomes continuous. Uh, the way how it becomes continuous is similar how you get a phonon spectrum from considering a set of uh, solving Schrodinger equation for a system with finite size and then making finite size infinite. Basically, to make long story short, um, the range of oscillations for all solutions with all values of n smaller than some critical one which scales as 1 over 2 minus gamma tends to progressively smaller frequencies and finally at gamma equal to 2 all the solutions essentially coincide with the n equal to 0 solution except for zero frequency <clears throat> while at the same time solutions with n larger than this critical which in this limit becomes infinite form a continuous set as a function as a ratio of two infinite numbers n and n and stars so then the number here the parameter here depends on what this ratio is and i say it in words but in fact we have analytics and numerics for this analytics is that for gamma equal to two we can start with a solution with small value of gap and expand in non-linearities and find that there is a continuous set of solutions. While for any gamma smaller than two, there is extra conditions that discretizes this uh, spectrum of solutions. So we find that from this side analytically, we find that from this side numerically by looking numerically how the scale of oscillations progressively sh shifts down to the lowest frequencies. So all solutions with all finite n are here. All solutions with n equal to infinity are here. And it's interesting. It means that uh, what started as a peculiarity with this infinite set of solutions end up with gapless branch of like longitudinal gap fluctuations for this particular value of gamma. And because we have extra gapless branch of excitations, of course, the question is how it affects superfluid statics. And again, to make long story short, let me tell you what the result is. Uh, we know how to calculate correction to stiffness due to this low energy state from this continuum spectrum. And the result is this one. There is effective stiffness in the sense that square of deviation of the phase, it's equal to T over this rho s effective. And so this stiffness is bare value. Remember the one that is always larger than instability temperature. So without this extra set, you just get large stiffness and this means no phase fluctuations, but there is a correction. And correction scales in power of T divided by the by frequency. There is also this uh, Elyashberg parameter here, but even if we said this Elyashberg parameter being of order of one as a limit where theory is still applicable, you still get a scale T over the by frequency, not T over G, much smaller scale, much larger correction. And although we can only let me be honest here, we can only calculate the first correction, still it gives you good indications that relevant temperature here is of the order of the by frequency rather than order of G. So which means that if I want were to define instability temperature where stiffness becomes of order of temperature, uh, then you will get this temperature of order of the by frequency, which means that when the by frequency goes to zero, this temperature goes to zero and you get a state where pairing exists but stiffness essentially vanishes. Which brings me to phase diagram. Of course, if you have stiffness vanishing at this point, then you can do all gradual expansion. And you find that, of course, if, in, if you are at gamma smaller than two, you always get superconductivity at low temperatures. But then there is a temperature where stiffness becomes a order of temperature. And then um, you go into, I call it pseudo gap, but in fact, it preformed pair state here. Or you can instead, here I change, I said the by frequency equal to zero and change gamma. Here I said, uh, said gamma equal to two and change the by frequency, you get the same behavior. This is more towards BCS behavior at large the by frequency. But in both cases, the key story is that we get um, 
out of this infinite set of solutions that present that are present everywhere, we, we got eventually a gapless spectrum of longitudinal excitation. And this brings me to second part of the story. I look at time, but I will try to finish in 10, 15 minutes. Uh, why gamma equal two is special? I already said this with motivation of the story, that on Matsubara axis, you get a pairing interaction that always seems to be positive, means attractive. And in this respect, gamma equal to two is just one, one power or one exponent of this interaction. But if you look at the same interaction on the real axis, you find something totally different. You just convert interaction from Matsubara to real axis. You can do this. And you find that, of course, interaction is generally complex, uh, which means that solution is also a complex function of frequency. But most importantly, um, if you go for gamma larger than one, you find out that real part of interaction changes sign and becomes repulsive. And if you approach gamma equal to two, then the imaginary part tends to vanish. So what happens is that interaction, which seemed completely innocent and attractive on Matsubara frequencies, looks like completely repulsive on real frequencies. Which brings me immediately to another part of the story, which hopefully you will see nice pictures here. What is the gap function on the real axis and what happens with the density of states, which give information about fermionic excitations? And I will try to show you another evidence that superconducting order gets progressively destroyed when exponent approach two. And for this, let's do something simple. We have, let's take the sign preserving solution on Matsubara axis and let's convert it to real frequencies. I didn't even put the big picture, but if gamma is smaller than one, nothing special happens. You go from sign preserving solution to sign preserving solution, so then conversion is just a, a unnecessary exercise. But if you have gamma larger than one, when real part of interaction and real frequencies is repulsive, you get something different. You start seeing oscillations of both real and imaginary part of frequency on the real frequency axis. Low frequency region is the same in both cases. High frequency regions is trivial is the same because if you take function one over omega to power of gamma, it's by Kramer's chronic transforms uh, on the real axis by just simple rotation. And you do see this behavior. But in between, you start seeing oscillations on the real frequency axis. And this was obtained, in fact, by converting equations into real frequency and solving them on the real frequency axis. And you can do this, in fact, analytically. Uh, and then, because both real and imaginary part are oscillates, you can look at what happens with the phase of the order parameter. And it turns out that phase has a number of phase slips, and this is integer number. So this oscillation produces integer number of phase slips, which means the phase varies by integer number of pi's. In fact, here, oh, sorry, two pi's here. Sorry. And this means immediately that there must be vortices. Because if you have phase slips along real axis, you have no phase slips along imaginary axis, and phase slips are topologically protected, then the only way how they can disappear by converting from real to Matsubara axis is when there are vortices at which phase slips disappear. And long story short, you can take delta double prime of this solution, use Cauchy relation, and uh, extend it analytically to the upper frequency half plane, and this is what you get you do get the appearance of vortices in the upper frequency half plane. These are dynamical vortices. These are not spatial vortices. But their behavior is very much similar to abricosal vortices in conventional case. Namely, first of all, you go from smaller gamma, you don't see any vortex. Then you take some particular value of gamma between one and two, and the first vortex appears. Then second one appears, and third one, etc., etc. And then you can look for various values of gamma, and you have three, four, nine, 17 vortices in a complex plane. So the vortices form essentially one-dimensional array in similarity to, it's of course one-dimensional triangular lattice, but it's still similarity with abricosa vortices. And uh, the question is, what about their number? And it turns out that their number tends to infinity when gamma tends to two, because the region when uh, on the real axis, uh, gap function oscillates tends to infinity. 
Uh, this what you get at gamma equal to two. We have infinite array of vertices which extend up to infinity. And besides that, this is nice, colorful picture. There is one immediate physics argument here. Then we all used to transform from Matsubara points to all upper half plane of frequency and then real frequency x. This is in fact how all calculations um, of Eliasberg machinery are done. But you can convert or you can transform from any infinite set of points in a complex plane. And here, on one hand, what I'm telling you may be surprising. I'm telling you that for gamma equal to two, there is infinite set, infinite array of points where gap vanishes because all these vortex points are points where delta equal to zero. So in a conventional sense, uh, if you have an array of points, infinite array of points where delta vanishes and you convert into um, frequency half plane, you should get zero everywhere. So in a normal sense of words, this would imply no pairing, even no pairing. And the only reason why you get non-zero result is in fact something which is normally written as a fine script in textbooks. This all works if there is no um, essential singularity at infinity. Here we have an example where this array of vortices ends up with essential singularity at infinity. And only because of this essential singularity, you get a non-zero solution. But this definitely doesn't sound like superconductivity. It sounds like something else. And I want to complement this with something more detailed. Let's look at the density of states. This is in some sense a measurable quantity. If you are at gamma smaller than two, density of states has wiggles features, but it's qualitatively different to BCS. Namely, density of states vanishes at small frequencies, then there is a peak, uh, asymmetric peak at uh, gap at zero frequency, and then some extra features which in fact in many cooperate literatures that were associated with the scattering of, a, of some sort of boson. There is no such thing here because boson frequency is exactly zero. This extra feature in fact due to dynamical vortices in the system. And these frequencies, one, two, three, whatever, are just universal ratio of this frequency. But when you go to gamma equal to two, you see something different happens, something qualitatively different happens that density of states becomes an array of delta functions. So you do something opposite to what I told you on Matsubara axis. So continuous, uh, continuous density of states becomes a discrete function with discrete values only at a set of universal numbers. Numbers means that if I measure everything as say in units of this frequency, then all other frequencies are just universal numbers times this frequency. So these are all universal frequencies. And uh, you get a behavior which is very different from what you see in the conventional case. Uh, this was first obtained by Roland Cambesco in 1995, a wonderful but very rarely cited paper. Uh, and then it was reproduced by Ilya Esteres and Jörg Schmalian in their studies of superconductivity in SYK type models. But one argument, one quick argument here is that um, if you have a discrete spectrum of excitations and you view uh, and you look at superfluid stiffness and uh, normally if you vary phase a little bit and stiffness is finite, you change system energy. If you view the same from fermionic point of view, to change energy, you have to rearrange fermions. If these points are all fixed because of fixing value of delta, there is no way to rearrange fermions because there is only discrete set of energies allowed for fermions. So this is qualitative argument why in this situation stiffness vanishes. And I want to finish the story with uh, something which we found recently that gamma equal to two is a transition, is a critical point. It's a critical point between superconducting state at zero temperature at smaller gamma and something different at gamma larger than two. And the way we see this, we calculated and obtained density of states for larger values of gamma. And what happens is interesting result. Instead of, let me go back, just, yeah. So there is a set of delta functions here. For gamma larger than two, all this delta function transforms into a single 
peak with infinite uh, magnitude. So there is one single peak which corresponds, which accumulate infinite number of states, just like in quantum Hall effect, uh, so in Hall effect generally. So capacity of this level is infinite, uh, which means that it can accommodate infinite number of particles, if you like. So we really have a macroscopic number of states with e equal energy, which normally means that there is zero mode in the problem, but uh, that's all we know at the moment. Mathematically, this happens because um, this generally peak in the density of states is where delta equal to omega, which in this notation requires a phi argument to be pi over two. And the question is how phi approaches pi over two. For conventional delta function, it will approach linearly. Here it approach quadratically, and because approach quadratically, when you take imaginary part, you will see that integral diverges. Which brings me to the end of the story. So uh, we did find a rather unusual phase diagram for the model, uh, such that if I look at pair formation, the pair formation temperature is non-zero for any value of gamma and saturates at large gamma at some finite value. But if you look at Tc defined via superfluid stiffness, then we definitely find that it vanishes here and we can get this line by continuity that goes up. And eventually, of course, at small gamma, it reaches Tp. So at small gamma, there's nothing in the story. But we also found interesting new phase for larger gamma, which uh, I invite everyone who is interesting to study because it's really highly unusual phase. And I don't know whether this is a crossover or the real transition temperature. So I leave it as it is. Uh, I prepared a number of slides going back to high TC and to uh, what happens in this intermediate state um, when you go from superconducting state to a state where phase is incoherent, but you preserve a, a magnitude of the order parameter. But let me just flash it because I look at the time. So let me just flash it. It's basically a story for a crossover from gap filling to gap closing. And you can see it in the density of states, which goes from a strong peak at low temperatures, which first go down with increasing temperature, which would be like gap closing, and then changing trends and start going up with temperature, which would be gap filling. And it's a change of function omega over delta, like in BCS, to function omega over T, like in a situation when you have um, just fluctuation driven density of states. So um, let me skip this part and just flank to conclusions. Basically, conclusion says that superconductivity, I studied interplay between superconductivity and non-Fermi liquid in a set of models, set of quantum critical models, which I label as gamma models. They all describe effective interaction mediated by a massless bosons with different exponent. Gamma should be there, but it's just not seen. Uh, and in some sense, the message which I can try to convey is that superconductivity both wins and loses in competition with non-Fermi liquid. It wins because pairing gap definitely develop below a certain temperature. So in a pure sense, pairing wins over non-Fermi liquid, but it's only partly superconductivity. And in particular, when exponents get larger, the difference between actual superconducting Tc and on set of pairing gets larger and Tc vanishes at gamma equal to two. And the rest is how we can see it from uh, either Matsubara axis or for real axis. There is a bunch of phenomena that I already described, so I'll probably not name it again. Uh, let me finish saying that this is one part of the story about general um, story of uh, non-Fermi liquid superconductivity and their competition at a quantum critical point in the metal. And uh, I just listed, uh, again, not complete list of people with whom I worked on various aspects of the story. So thanks to all of them. And thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, hi, Adrian. Thank you very much for a very great talk. Uh, now let's move to the question session. Uh, shall I go ahead and ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, hi, Andre. Um, hi. That's a very uh, thought-provoking 
um, talk. Um, I'm curious about the uh, discrete density of states that you um, showed near the end. Um, could you please um, give some interpretation of what that is about? Is that uh, are those different kinds of uh, pair bound states that you are showing in the uh, in this result? Uh, I would not call it different pair bound states. Uh, this is all okay just not to confuse you. Uh, this was all done for uh, one solution on Matsubara axis. So as I said, for gamma equal to two, all solutions with any finite number of sign changes uh, actually merge with n equal to zero solution because oscillation uh, shrink to zero frequency. So it depends how you take a limit omega goes to zero and n goes to infinity or keep n finite and omega goes to zero. But still, for any finite frequency, there is just one solution. Mm -hmm. You look at the same solution. Maybe I can put one more thing here. You look at the same solution on... So it's this solution. It's just one solution. So in this respect, there is one gap there. You look at the same solution on real frequency axis. And you find that both real and imaginary part oscillates. In fact, imaginary part in this case uh, mm -hmm. becomes very small and reduces to a set of delta functions. But real, real, real part changes sign and uh, goes from positive to negative. And this holds for all frequencies. So there is no decay, which I show here. In fact, the frequency of this decay goes to infinity. Once you have this kind of thing, you look at the density of states. And it turns out that the density of states goes like this because there is a discrete set of points when uh, delta is equal to omega. Mm -hmm. The way how I interpret is this. When you look at conventional density of states, right? Each point here is, in fact, solution omega is equal to square root of delta square plus epsilon square, which means that for any, for all the, for any value of omega, there is some epsilon which give you a uh, delta function over which you integrate, right? So this is integrated delta function of omega minus square root of epsilon square plus delta square. And mm -hmm. it's qualitatively similar to this one. There are wiggles again, but it means that uh, there are effective epsilon k for any values of omega. How to interpret this? Besides, that this is the result, and that's it. I interpret it as if there is effective discretization of a load epsilon of, of K, which means, yes, there is a discretization of a load energy of fermions in the paired state, mm -hmm. because these are fermionic energies. Instead of continuum, you have a set of um, delta functions. And if you go further to this case, there is just one value. Right. So again, this is level with infinite capability. Mm -hmm. uh, I view it in line with, uh, I mostly phrase it in my head, in line with superfluid stiffness, namely that you cannot reshovel fermionic states um, if you want to uh, change the phase of the order parameter a bit, or put it differently, you have pairs of fermions and you have an infinite number of states into which you can put uh, different pairs. So mm -hmm. you put, it's basically like independent pairs of fermions, each with its independent phase, and each pair you put on a given level, and this level is when all of them are degenerate in energy, which to my opinion means that stiffness is exactly zero. But this is all I know about. So again, I welcome more interpretation and more studies of this phenomenon. Um, just a, a follow-up. Uh, for the discrete case, what do you think happens to translational invariance? Well, this, this is again, this is all interpretation. Okay. I, I, I have n of omega, which is discrete set. I already integrated over epsilon k. So originally I have a problem with full translational invariance. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that I can only interpret the results as some sort of effective energies, et cetera, but not original ones. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, qu question, Andre. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about what of all this survives uh, if there is any Q dependence to the interaction? Well, look, again, Q interaction was originally Q dependent. The uh, way how I obtained this exponent no, no. gamma, I integrated over Q. 
that that won't do. Uh, when you get uh, very peculiar results like you've gotten, you have to not eliminate the Q-dependent. I'm just wondering whether some of these results are because you have a point model. No, no, no. I think that, uh, again, what I tried, what I did in particular cases, uh, suppose you get just for sake of the argument, suppose you have Ising pneumatic critical point. Interaction is one over Q square plus gamma omega over Q. It has complete Q dependence. But if you want to put it into equations, you need to integrate over Q. And because I have the small parameter, I factorize momentum integration. So I integrate this interaction along Fermi surface, which means over one component of Q. And this is how I get one over omega to power of one third. I understand. I, I'm saying, supposing yeah. you do not integrate away the Q dependence, will you still have all these uh, curious features survive? Uh, you are asking, or, yeah, I think you are asking this. What if you don't factorize the momentum integration? What if you go back to original problem and do it? I think that most of the things will survive. And we checked this, in fact, for Ising pneumatic case explicitly by comparing uh, factorized and non-factorized results. But to be completely certain that everything survives, I cannot say, yeah. But gamma equal to two is a special case when you get one over omega square behavior. It's analytic, and therefore, in this respect, um, um, uh, it should survive. But uh, just very quickly to maybe add to the answer, if you put Q, Q dependence to uh, electron phonon interaction, then you get a to smaller gamma. But of course, then the question is, do you have any other instabilities besides superconductivity? Do you have any preemptive instabilities that will change the story? Probably. So the question is that I'm not sure that the system will ever reach actual limit gamma equal to two. But this is why I so much emphasize this uh, phase diagram. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, that even if you are not here, and you are somewhere here, you still have the range. And even if you go not vertically, but something like this, which is the case when you include feedback from the pairing on the boson, you still have this range. That's all I can say. Andre, uh, can yes. I, uh, could I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so you presented in sort of the first part of the talk, you presented the story of having a finite number of nodes on a Matsubara frequency axis, or rather infinite set of solutions with mm -hmm. different number of nodes. Mm -hmm. So let us for now ignore gamma equal two, that special point. Let's stick for gamma between one and two, mm -hmm. right? And then in the last part of the talk, you said, okay, and now I'm going to look only at n equals zero, the sign preserving solution. Mm -hmm. I'm going to analytically continue in the upper half plane. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, what I find is that there is a finite number of uh, these dynamical vortices. Uh -huh. And how many I get actually depends on what the value of gamma is. I think it's exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened if you took, instead of sign preserving solution, what if you took n equal one or n equal two? Very good question, very good question. Exactly the same, uh, immediate question, immediate answer, exactly the same number of vortices. And what it means is this, that uh, there is a difference between behavior uh, at omega smaller than g and omega larger than g. All these vortices, if I go back space, all these vortices, are at frequencies larger than g. At frequencies smaller than g, it's a scale of one here. At frequencies smaller than g, delta is pretty much a constant. And here is what you get on the real axis. Now, why I'm saying this? Because if you look from this perspective into all other solutions, on this plot, they will look exactly the same with different magnitude, of course, at all frequencies larger than g and will just oscillate here in the tiny range of small frequencies. So that would correspond to vortices on the Matsubara axis. But the behavior of all solutions at omega larger than g is the same one over omega to power gamma dependence. And this, in this respect, the, all solutions give you the same story with the vortices. Uh, what it means, to be honest with you, I don't quite understand. 
Uh, I know what happens with gamma equal to two. I know how a solution becomes undistinguishable. But um, uh, at this stage, I can only say that we are absolutely certain that number of vortices is independent on n. It's the same um, for all n. Whether the position is the same, which would be even more exciting things, this I cannot guarantee. Mm -hmm. Andre, and then a follow-up. So in a sense, the, the peculiar result that, you've, that you and Artyom found of this numbers, uh, well, a different number of topologically distinct solution with different number of sign changes. As you pointed out, they all have different condensation energies. They all have different TCs. And naively, you would say, well, the highest TC or the largest condensation energy would win. And that's always n equals zero, correct? Right, exactly. So the question exactly. is, to what extent should we, I'm not saying what you did is in any way, uh, you know, Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But what would you do with this n equal one or n equal two solution if in some sense they're immaterial? Wouldn't you agree? Like they, they all, you would never see them unless you somehow suppress n equal zero solution. Um, this is exactly what I mean by this phase diagram. This is where, this is the point where all the solution condense into a single one. And this is how you get this massless mode of excitations. Go to this point. Excitations are massive but pretty dense, so the gap is very small. Mm -hmm. Of course, at zero temperature, you have n equal to zero solution only dominates, you have complete superconductivity. But then, if you go up in temperature, you have a spectrum. And essentially, the spectrum essentially remains continuous for this purpose, but gapped. Uh, and so then you overcome this gap in the spectrum, you go back to the space. So this is what I was trying to say, is that you have this point when uh, stiffness is zero, and you have this point where nothing happens. And so TC would go as in between these two points, and we know how to expand around this point, so we know the initial behavior here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I'm saying, that of course, at low temperature, it's normal superconductor in the sense. But the question is that there are a bunch of low energy excitations waiting at some distance away. And this, their number is infinite. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. And is there a way to probe them? Would there be some thermodynamic signature very close to TC? Something I would say that the best is the best, in fact. I think so, the best is to probe uh, this. Mm -hmm. Because again, uh, this is, you know, all the stories about uh, extra peaks due to interaction with the gap boson, when this frequency is delta, this frequency is delta plus uh, boson frequency, this del delta plus twice boson frequency, etc. Mm -hmm. This story is completely different. If this is delta, this is delta times number, this is delta times another number, third number, and there are universal numbers here. So uh, this would be interesting to probe. Great, thanks. Okay, A any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Professor Andrew again. Okay? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks,